Welcome to the third in the series of Come and Be Revived, a series of six talks on social justice with a partnership between the Readership Training and Chester Cathedral. And today we welcome the person who I have been liaison with, the Reverend Liz Shercliffe, Director of Studies for Readers in Chester Diocese, and Sharon Amazlu, Leadership Facilitator of St George's House, Windsor Castle, and also Chair of the Greater Manchester Branch of the Institute of Directors. They're both going to speak on the topic of invisible women. Before I hand over to them, a prayer for us all. Loving God, we pray that we might always see with your eyes the people you have created, that we may notice the poor, the vulnerable, the weak in our society, and all who walk with us who are seemingly invisible. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I hand over to you, Liz and Sharon. Welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Sharon, thanks for doing this with me. Um, it's really exciting to be working with you. You're a barrister, a leadership specialist, an award-winning public speaker, a governor of Manchester Adult Education Service, and next year you're going to be giving a TED talk as well. So by April next year I'll be able to say I know someone who's done a TED talk. <laughs> you're not an invisible woman, are you? <laughs> Only, well, my kids would say otherwise, I'm sure. <laughs> But yes, I do, um, I have experienced that sense of invisibility, Liz, most definitely. In what ways? Hmm. So I think, um, I, think I, I really, first of all, feel very honoured and privileged to be here and to be having this conversation with you around invisible women. And as you've pointed out, the, the nature of my work has been historically within the business sector, um, and also within the legal sector, which is where I started my career. And so when I think about this idea of invisible women, I, I see it and have witnessed it both at a, a systemic level, but also in a day-to-day -day operational lived experience. And I became, in particular, I became really interested in how this plays out at a, at a, at a systemic level in my role when I was the uh, chair of the Greater Manchester Branch of the Institute of Directors. And it was just witnessing when I'd enter the room with working with directors who the organization principally represents and seeing the underrepresentation of, of directors in the room at various events. And understanding that when we have reports that come to us like the Hampton Alexander Review that reveals that only 6% of the 5,100 companies have um, women as, as CEOs and the underrepresentation under at that level. But I think about the judiciary and only a quarter of the judiciary being female and at the Supreme Court, only 17%. That alarms me because for me, visibility is experienced through representation. And it matters because when we look at how much of the population is made up of women, where you don't have women's voices in the room at decision-making tables, then they're notably absent and decisions are being made on their behalf about things that directly impact their lives. So that's the systemic level, but also just day to day as well, Liz. So there's some really interesting research that points to the fact that Men are male counterparts, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is there is any malintent on their part, but the research points to the fact that men will dominate a conversation up to 75% compared with our, our, our female counterparts. And that often looks like being interrupted and talked over in a meeting. And that's when I think about invisibility, I think about voice. I think about being heard. And if you are wanting to contribute in a meeting, but in fact you're being talked over or ignored, or what often happens is an idea that you might posit might be taken over by someone else, by a male counterpart, and then that be affirmed and recognized, that can be really diminishing a voice. So you see it in, in so many ways, both at the broader systemic level, but also 
also day to day. But what I am, I, I'm most pleased to be having this conversation with you, actually, Liz, because as you know, I'm a huge fan of your book, Preaching Women. And um, what I've loved about your book and the research that you put into this and your whole thinking behind how within the Christian community and within uh, our understanding of biblical text, how women have, women's voices have been silenced. And I, I'm really interested in understanding from you what you see, uh, why is it so important for women to be heard and what do you see as the nexus between being heard and being seen? Actually, I think if you're not seen, then you're not heard at all. Um, there's an American sociologist that I talk about in the book, I think, called Michael Kimmel. Um, and he did a TED talk called Why Gender Equality is Good for Everyone. And uh, he talks about being an undergraduate and being part of a conversation with some women where before feminism was a, a subject at university. And he overheard a white woman and a black woman speak to each other. And the white woman said, you see, I think feminism is for everybody because women experience things the same way. And the black woman said, well, that's the problem right there. Um, because when I look in the mirror in the morning, I see a black woman and you see a woman. And Michael Kimmel realized that that was the problem because when he looked in the mirror in the morning, he saw a human being. And if we see, if we don't see differences, then we assume everybody's like us. So if sure. I don't see you as who you are, I assume you're kind of another Liz Shercliffe, if you like. So we have to see differences before we can hear other people's voices. And um, to hear other people's stories and hear other people's voices is what leads to understanding. I think we've lost the importance of story and gone down the input gone down the route of arguing with each other whereas story is actually the way to understand people and story is what makes us visible and gives us voices uh, and understanding i think so so powerful liz why do you think we've we've shifted away from story which i think jesus really he spoke through stories didn't he, he used parables all the time to teach us but why is it we we've shifted from from story to these polarized arguments and I as a as a lawyer by profession that's my default it's it's to be entrenched in an opinion and to seek to persuade rather than seeking to create shared awareness why do you think we've become so polarized in that way I think some of it is part is to do with the enlightenment and I think the church kind of responded to the, to the scientific enlightenment by trying to make faith about propositions. So, so we reduce the Bible in some ways to propositional faith. Uh, and in churches like ours, where we say the creed every, every Sunday, that doesn't really help very much because we say we believe all these things. But actually, when Jesus knew that he was going to die on the following day, he didn't get out a flip chart and give, him, give his disciples 10 points they needed to remember. He gave them bread and wine around a table, which is basically about fellowship and about body and, and about imbibing things. It's much, much more visceral than, than the cerebral attitude towards faith, I think. That's beautiful. But yeah, so I know the Bible is important to you. What, what stories have you found are helpful to you? Oh, so there are, there are so many. I, I love the Bible because I feel that it, it is one of the most powerful ways of us understanding what it is to be a powerful woman. And it's because we see so the, the women who emerge, the stories that emerge of women who have stood their ground, who've been courageous, who've used their voice, who've been persistent. They've done that against a societal tide against them. Mm -hmm. And so to have that level of resilience and forthrightness against the odds, I think you shine even more brightly. And, and, I, and I think about the, the incredible women in scripture and I find them inspiring. I, I think first of all, actually, of, of Hagar, um, and the fact that she was, of course, rejected from Abraham and Sarah's home. And while she's out with her son, Ishmael, in the desert, 
she is visited by God and says, you are the God who sees me. El Roy, you are the God who sees me. And immediately we've got this, this picture of God seeing a woman, seeing a woman who was rejected. He immediately places that, that stamp on that I see you. And so that message comes in the earliest part of scripture that God sees us, he sees women as we are. But I also think about those remarkable women, in particular as, as a woman in business. I think about Lydia um, in Acts. This woman who was industrious and resourceful, she clearly was a successful businesswoman. I, I think of her as um, the Harrod supplier of her day because scripture talks about her producing high-end purple cloth. I think, goodness me, she must have been of some significant standing in her time to be recognized and wear that label in that way at that time. But among, uh, alongside that, Liz, it's this idea of not only her being a successful businesswoman, she was also a believer mm -hmm. and also she was hospitable. She welcomed these people into her home. She was a woman of good character and she was a good leader because we know that when she became a believer, her whole household also became believers. Such was her influence. So across the board, we've got this influential woman across every single important index, as it were. And I think, wow, what, what an inspirational woman. I also um, am very much inspired by, and, and they're, they're somewhat obscure, but they've inspired me for many years. And it's the, the daughters of Zelophehad back in, in the book of, of Numbers. And these, these daughters, so it's at the point at which Moses is distributing the land. And of course, we know that inheritance was traditionally a male inheritance that women couldn't inherit. And as the, the, the Israelites have journeyed through the desert and they're, they're at the point now that land is going to be allocated to them, and all of that, the, there's this distribution to all of the male um, heirs. And then you've got these, these daughters, these five daughters of Zelophehad, whose father had died. And therefore, in theory, they would have no rights at all to any property. And yet still, they, they make their way to the tent of meeting and they say, well, we don't have, my dad didn't have any male heirs, but it cannot be the case that his name dies out and we are not able to inherit anything. And I just have this image in my mind, Liz, of them wading through this crowd and they'd hear these muffled voices from the men, going, where do they think they're going? Who do they think they are? But notwithstanding that, with grit and determination, they make their way and they state their claim. And I think, how courageous. How inspirational, what strong women these daughters of Zelophehad, had. And because they were willing to do that, their names are now written in scripture. And I think there's a, a whole host of incredible stories like that that say that there are women who are willing to take a stand and be visible and do what was right in, in that time. I just think it's, it, it's just wonderful to know. I, uh, I love the fact, Liz, that this whole series that we're exploring with Chester Cathedral is about social justice. That's the umbrella that it sits under. Can you tell me from your perspective, what is the correlation, the nexus between being seen, visibility and social justice? Um, I think, well, I've, I've been reading and, the, and, I, and I pinched the title from this book, you know, Caroline Criado yeah. Perez's book, uh, Invisible Women. And she basically is writing about data, uh, which sounds really dull, but it's not. Um, and she comes up with things like some of the stuff that she has done has hit the press sort of in the last year or so. But things like the fact that drugs until the 1980s were never tested on women. They were only tested on men. And so it was a surprise to medics when drugs had a different effect on women's bodies than they did on men's. Uh, and that was seen as sort of an outlier or atypical rather than something to be taken into account. Yeah. Um, heart attacks is another one. 50% um, of women are misdiagnosed because they don't have Hollywood heart attacks. You know, they don't clutch the chest and fall over with chest pain. <laughs> Um, yes. In fact, quite a, a lot of women who have heart attacks don't have those symptoms. Mm. And yet, as late as 2016, 
the British Medical Journal said that that was atypical. And, you know, you should still expect to see women with, with chest pains for that. I think more recently, um, PPE has hit the press, hasn't it? Personal protective equipment. And uh, I'm sure we've all seen photographs of how painful it is to wear in hospitals and things like that. But actually, PPE is designed for the average male body. Yeah. And so it's uncomfortable for women. And uh, the same happens actually with um, PPE for police officers. So women police officers are more likely to be stabbed because stab vests are made for men's bodies. And because women have got breasts, they raise. And so women are not protected. Um, it's, it has struck me with the current crisis that women, it seems, are being uh, most adversely affected career-wise and yeah. in terms of stress because women have borne the brunt of balancing work and homeschooling yeah. and all those things. And yet the government's advisory committee is entirely male. And so there's nobody saying, hang on a minute, have you thought about how that might affect so-and-so? Um, Another example is I visited um, Style Prison a year or so ago and at that time the chaplain told me there was no woman in that prison who hadn't been sexually abused beforehand. And so a lot of the a lot of social justice is affected by the way women are previously treated I think. Sure. I mean just going back to um, your story about Lydia which I love as well. I had a friend at college who did some research onto who the women might have been who were the dyers that that worked for Lydia and um, the theory that she came up with and it's quite well researched was that they might have been ex-prostitutes who'd sort of been damaged or been ill and she'd taken them in and given them work to do Amazing. and so that was Lydia's charitable contribution if you like as well but it means the first church on European soil was probably entirely women. Wow how incredible yeah so that's that's really interesting isn't it it's very very interesting yeah there, there is definitely a nexus between us between women being seen and fairness in and in and equality in society yeah 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 and, yeah. and if we're not seeing that where decisions are being made about our lives we won't mm. be heard yeah and it affects the way we read the Bible, doesn't it? Because it, we, women are either, you know, virgins or prostitutes in the way that a lot of people present the Bible, I think. Um, do you, have you got any tips about how to read the Bible so that you can find women's stories more easily or read them better? Yeah, I think um, for me, well, one of the tips actually I got from your book, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm obviously going to be earning some credits here, Liz, yeah yeah <laughs> today definitely i'm on a commission of some description <laughs> of some description i'm sure i've shared it that widely but um i think it's it's in the forward um by um bishop libby lane i believe yeah and she talks about listening harder mm. listening harder and looking harder and the reason why i think that's quite striking is because the stories are not explicit, sufficiently explicit about women and the contributions of women and their experience of Jesus or their experience of a revelation of God. They're not explicit. It, the narrative is principally male. And so, for example, um, when we hear about Abraham being instructed to up sticks and leave from his um, father's home and family, we, we don't hear the narrative for Sarah. Mm. Like what did it actually mean for her? And so what it requires us to do is, is really just think about what it would mean and look harder and listen harder to, to Sarah's story in that. And, and also what I feel is, is helpful for me and I encourage the people to, to do is just really understand that um, God is an inclusive God. Mm. And if we can read from that perspective, that, that we, that women are the, the, the full expression of God in his image, male and female, he created them. So to understanding that and having that paradigm 
holding that in our minds as we read scripture. I feel that it'll help us to lean in and hear the voices a little bit more clearly, but we definitely have to listen harder and look harder because they, they, they lack the full exposure that men do in, in scripture. Yeah. And that, I think that leads me on this to my question of you really, as to why it is that the visibility of women, if at all, why is it that the visibility of women is so important to, to the body of Christ, experiencing the fullness of Christ? Um, I think there are two reasons. I think one is missional and one is related to our ministry or our worship. Um, I think missionally, it's very difficult to speak about social justice if you don't speak about gender justice. And it's very difficult to care for women and girls in other countries if we don't care about women and girls in this country. Um, sure. And I rather suspect that the church has been a bit guilty of that. Um, and I'll just, uh, since you've mentioned my book, I'll just read you a bit because I spent ages writing it and it's <laughs> better to read it than, than say it without, you know. Um, yeah, so I said, um, we can't denounce ill treatment of girls around the world through FGM or prostitution or low wage or anything else if we tolerate actions and attitudes that marginalise them in our own congregations. We cannot denounce the ill treatment of women around the world if we preach from a Bible that treats them as sources of temptation and sin. We have to speak the truth persistently about sexism in the world, the church and the Bible. I'm not convinced that we have a gospel to proclaim if the gospel we proclaim does not require gender equality. I don't accept that there can be good news for some, but not for others, or that good news for some is more important than good news for all. Wow. So as you say, I think the gospel has got to be inclusive and that's, it compromises our mission if we fail to make that clear. And from, from the point of view of worship, um, somebody put, some, put something on my Facebook page the other day about God being male and I thought you know he's really really not <laughs> you know God is God God is not male um, God, God can loads of, yeah there's loads of biblical texts that compare God to women and, um, and so I finished the book with saying um, it's not about equality it's more important than that it drives at the heart of God's self-revelation to and through humanity and God's performative grace in creation. When God's revelation is warped by exclusion or dismembered by suppression, all people suffer. Uh, and the fullness of God's presence in our lives needs God's activity in both women and men to be manifest. Otherwise, both excluded uh, women and exalted men suffer. So, so I think for those two reasons, we need to get it right. So beautiful. It's so poetic hearing you read it. <laughs> I've read it myself, but hear your, hearing your own voice is so powerful and um, really compelling. Mm. Wow. So we'll let some more people into the conversation. Yes, certainly. <laughs> So, so do people want to comment or ask questions? If you do, if you raise a hand and then unmute yourself, that would be good. Looks like Jane, I can see Jane there. Yes, off you go, Jane. Can I just mention two things? First of all, Trevor Dennis's book and Sarah laughed. Uh, he was our former vice dean at the cathedral and a committed feminist. And his book picks out women's stories in the Bible that are often overlooked. So it's well worth a read. I mean, he wrote it a long time ago, uh, mm. but it is, is very well worthwhile. And also, this month's Good Housekeeping magazine. No, got the right picture. Got a <laughs> black one. But um, there's an article by um, Sarah, uh, I got the right name, um, June Sarpong. And she mentions five inspirational black women worth knowing a bit more about. It's Black History Month, apparently, in October. Uh, so she mentioned Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, we were, of course we've, we've heard of those two, but Madam C.J. Walker, first female self-made millionaire in America of any race, made, became a multimillionaire selling hair products for black women. Yes. Um, Yar Asantua, she's my favorite, Yar Asantua, 
uh, queen mother of the Ashanti nation uh, empire. And she took on the British at the age of 60 and won. Um, and Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black person to run for the Democratic Party's uh, presidential no nomination. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, that, that's, we were asking last week, well, what can we read? What can we do? What can we find? And those five women um, are mentioned. In, good housekeeping is not necessarily the first place you'd go to turn to. No, no. Inspirational black women, but it's yeah. there. Black woman on the cover and this lovely article by Jim Sarpong. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. If, um, Thank if anyone's you. got Netflix, um, the, yeah. the, the documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg is very well worth a watch. It's very inspiring about what she did and how she coped with um, bias and misogyny and everywhere, really, when she started out. So that's another inspiring woman. Yeah. And Thank Madam C.J. Walker as well, there's a, a series that's based on her life on Netflix as well, which I'd highly recommend. Great story. Thanks for that, Jane. Jackie had her hand raised, I think. Thank you. Sorry, I, I just wanted to emphasise the importance of this question. Um, I realised that my journey led me to Quaker tradition because I had a very strong, I didn't realize it, but that was probably because of the equality I felt of women, which wasn't recognized in the Anglican church when I was younger. Um, and uh, I have been concerned, I find quite a lot of the Old Testament quite difficult because it seems male justification quite frequently of things we wouldn't accept sometimes um, but there's also the question of how women continue to be but have been written out of history including the bible i, I believe the first apostle to rome was a woman um, and we we know how the question of uh, the various marys mary magdalene and so on have all been muddled and uh, as Liz was saying, made into either prostitutes or, <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> yeah. usually prostitutes yes. um, or reformed ones. So, uh, yes, I, I just wanted to say thank you and uh, I will try and find your books at some stage. But I'm, I'm even conscious within the Quaker tradition, um, I mean, we were very fortunate to have Margaret Fell early on who um, kept the networks going when the men were in prison very often um, but uh, I've I'm raising at the moment whether even in our tradition we're being focused enough particularly with the COVID mm. questions at the moment on yeah. gender equality. Yeah. Jackie I wish I had time I've um, one of the one of the projects that I did during lockdown to try and help my daughter out my daughter's in Edinburgh was to do some story writing with my granddaughter and my granddaughter's seven and she really objects to bible stories about girls because they're all girly girls and that as you describe them um, and my granddaughter martha rewrote the story of ruth and um churches together in alderley edge actually published it as, as a daily reflection uh, but but she rewrote it so that it would you I think you would approve of it, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions at all? Yes, um, Galaxy Tab. I've forgotten your name, which is dreadful. You have to unmute first, though. Right? Can you hear me? Yep. Don't, don't you, uh, Sharon, you mentioned these wonderful ladies from the scriptures, but I adore the story of Tamar in Genesis 38. Uh, and you think um, she had a terrible life, really. Um, but And what she did with Judah, I wouldn't have uh, recommended. But she was an ancestress of our Lord. And uh, I just find her story is so encouraging. Mm. And she really stands out in scripture. I wondered what you thought of Tamar. Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Sharon. Yeah. So her story is, um, I guess, that one of the things about scripture that I love 
is that there are so it, it doesn't present a picture of perfect people mm. what it presents is a picture of flawed people redeemed by god yeah and yeah. what it presents is, is a picture of um of uh of a god who can take anyone from anywhere transform their lives and raise them up and elevate them to a point at which they can be in the ancestral lineage even of our lord and it's it's such a redemptive story in that in that sense um, and so powerful so as as to her story incredibly moving because because of that same point it shows the redemptive power of god, of god yeah. there is no one who has gone too far from him but he cannot the inclusive god brings in their story and makes it mainstream yeah. it's the same with rahab wasn't it yes exactly the same mm. thank you thank you and and so sophie has a question hi i'm sorry i was late <laughs> Um, I have a question really about the social justice side, um, thinking from the perspective of um, church really thinking about how for me more kind of dangerous than the invisibility of women is the partial visibility of women, like we're okay as long as we're quiet, we're okay as long as we're not up front um, and there are so many churches you know mutual flourishing um, where that's, that's being allowed if not promoted um and that's quite a concern for me i just wondered if you have any advice on that or any thoughts either i think it's a really important issue um i was re i can't remember what i was reading the other day but they said uh, women are, women are being allowed to preach as long as they say the things they're expected to say um and that's a real danger and i and i would encourage anybody who preaches leads bible studies whatever it might be to deliberately read the Bible from the kind of perspective that Sharon and I have been talking about. And that's really hard because, especially if you're in a training position as a reader or as a, a curate or a trainee minister, because there'll be expectations from the congregation that you say what they expect to hear and from your training minister that you say what you're expected to say. But actually, if it's about social justice and about a right image of God, then I think the call of a woman preacher is to tell women's stories uh, and have women's voices heard. And that might mean upsetting people sometimes, which is, mm -hmm. is a difficult thing to do. But I don't know, Sharon, what do you think? Yeah, uh, great point. And uh, I think it, it's like um, being pregnant. So you, you're either pregnant or you're not. You can't be pregnant-ish. You can't have justice ish. So you're, it's either justice, and that is the the embracing of all of us as we are in totality, or it's not. It's not. It's not justice. It's not fairness. It's not equality and parity. And I think the danger is the lure of, as you said, Sophie, this partial justice, the lure of that, the appeal of that, because what it does is for those who permit the, the, um, the partial voice, the, the, the sense is that they've done their part. We've done that now. We've, al we've allowed you a bit of space. Here you are. Um, accept that and be satisfied. That, that's a danger because actually they're missing out. And it's one of the points that I often talk about, even in the workplace, this idea that... Um, if you've got some level of representation, as long as you let them in the door, but you don't let them talk, just let them in the door. But actually there's a disadvantage to you because you're missing out on a, a valuable perspective. And I often use the example of the rising tide that raises all boats. When you hear all of those voices, it enriches your experience and it, it strengthens your leadership when you're hearing more diverse voices. But also for those who are and I, don't get me wrong, I know that there's often, there's a power play, there's a, there's a power dynamic so that influences us being able to push for more. But I love what, um, again, Liz says in her book about the importance and the power of anger and courage. Because what I believe happens is if, if we remain 
um, within us this, we have within us this frustration because everyone is born to speak. We're born, born to have a voice. Everyone is born to have a voice. And if we are in any way silenced, whether we silence ourselves or we silence others, that expression will fester and it will emerge, it will erupt in some way or other. And so the lure is to say, well, we'll be satisfied with, with this um, partial voice. We actually are not. We're not really satisfied. What we really want is the ability to have our voice and bring that full, um, in its fullness to the table because that's what God designed for us. So what I, what I say is that the lure on either side is a dangerous one and it's a false one. It's a fallacy that actually this push for us to have this equal voice justice for all at the table is i believe the, the call of god for humanity one of the things about mutual flourishing i think which sophie mentioned is it's supposed to be about openness and i can't hide when i go to preside at communion or whatever that i'm a woman and yet churches in traditions who don't accept women's ministry hardly ever say so on their websites and so people who feel like going to church can look at a website and it will just say we're whatever we are catholic tradition bible believing christian you know whatever the terminology might be and nowhere is it, nowhere does it openly say and by the way we don't accept women's ministry you have to find that out and yet on the other side a church that accepts women's ministry can't hide because it's got women in ministry usually thank you thank you we have time for one final question yes terry if you unmute yourself first terry i'm being brave in speaking <laughs> um two two things first of all i believe so much in inclusive God. Um, and have done for a long time. But I suspect that me and other males have been part of the difficulty in not speaking up. Silent male. And I think it's the same thing with white people in the race issues. The second thing is, I really struggle, struggle with in church speaking, praying to God, trying to avoid the male which comes out Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, the Lord's Prayer, for example. How do, we, how do I deal with that? <laughs> the New Zealand Prayer Book's very good, Terry. Uh, that's much more inclusive. And actually, I went to um, a wedding in Edinburgh uh, last, last year, and they've written a more inclusive liturgy as well. And so um, if I'm leading worship with students or if I'm praying by myself, I quite often go to those two sources. Um, and if I'm preaching, I try, I, I say God or God's self or repeat God or whatever it might be, uh, or alternate between he and she, uh, which is a bit clumsy, but I can't think of, we, we're stuck with the English language, aren't we? <laughs> but I'm, I'm uh, writing another book with a friend of mine, Kate Bruce, which will come out next summer um, about, women in the Bible that we don't often hear about. And one of the things I was quite keen to do was to have a chapter about woman wisdom from Proverbs, because uh, the Bible talks about woman wisdom being there at the beginning. And I think that's quite a helpful thought, because if woman wisdom was there at the beginning, then there is that kind of feminine aspect in creation before the whole of the rest of it. Can I conclude by thanking you both? Sharon and Liz, very, very much for helping us understand and think through some of those issues. I hope that you've all been inspired or challenged or irritated to change your minds in some way or another. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Next week, we have Professor David Clough, who is the Professor of Theological Ethics at the University of Chester, and he's speaking on Christianity, animals, and the climate crisis. So do join us then. I'll be sending out another link for you for next week. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Lovely to see you.